of ABC News with Terry Moran and Cynthia McFadden in New York City and Bill Weir in Las Vegas. This is Nightline, May 26th, 2011. Up next, a story that brought us here, incredible claims, and a new book on Area 51, the top secret government test site just north of Las Vegas. We challenge the author to back her story up. Nightline continues from Las Vegas with Bill Weir. Sin City markets itself on the ability to keep secrets, but this town has nothing on the slice of Nevada known as Area 51. For decades, the government kept such a tight lid on the place, many people assumed they must be hiding UFOs. So when a sensational new book claimed to have the real story based on the newly declassified lives of the men who worked there, we jumped on the chance to meet the author and her sources. But what we found disturbed us in ways we never imagined. If you leave the rattle and hum on the Las Vegas Strip and head an hour and a half north, you'll find a military test range the size of Connecticut. And out in the middle of all that hot dust and jet fumes are airstrips and hangars few people have ever seen. A place that for decades officially did not exist. The nearest town is tiny Rachel, Nevada, and if you stop by the little alien, the there are plenty of locals who will tell you why they think their neighborhood has been so secretive for so long. I would have called it a flying saucer. I've seen orbs, balls of light moving erratically. I did the math one time. It was about 23,000 miles an hour. I think they also may be reverse engineering uh, UFOs out there. While few know exactly what happens out there these days, the CIA finally admits there is an Area 51. And for the first time, the unsung heroes of the Cold War are able to talk about it. People would ask me, uh, what are you guarding? I don't figure it's any of your business. To guard Area 51, Richard Mingus took an oath of silence, along with all the others who spent their careers in a sun-baked wasteland, locked in a race to build and test better flying weapons than their arch enemies in the Soviet Union. My first impression was seeing the Soviet MiGs sitting on the tarmac as we were landing, and that was very exciting. Did you know we had a MiG at that point? No. T.D. Barnes took apart a captured Russian fighter and helped build America's first stealth aircraft. And engineer Jim Friedman became Area 51's trusted courier. But neither man could tell their wives how they spent their days. In fact, Jim's family thought he was a TV repairman. The wife says, where are you going for a whole week? I can't tell you. It took special people not to break up. But it was impossible to keep every test flight away from prying eyes, and with every civilian sighting came a new type of conspiracy theory. Not conventional aircraft then, what did they see? Here's a plane streaking at 90,000 feet, which is twice or better than any conventional plane. And at that speed, it was a UFO sighting. Many believe this place still holds the key to the biggest UFO mystery of them all. The flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Legend has it that after a flying saucer crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, the wreckage and the aliens inside were taken to Area 51 for study. After interviewing dozens of former pilots, engineers, and spies, L.A. Times writer Annie Jacobson details a number of top-secret weapons tests. But she concludes they were not the reason for Area 51's constant secrecy. Instead, it was something else. One of them tells me something that completely stuns me and causes my jaw to drop. Everything that the myth of Roswell is has an element of truth. And then he tells me he can't tell me any more about it. She says her secret source told her that the flying saucer didn't come from outer space, but from Russia. And inside were not little green men, but horribly disfigured children. They were about 13 years old, and they had been manipulated surgically or genetically to appear as if they were aliens. After World War II, she writes, Joseph Stalin employed Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele to create alien lookalikes out of human guinea pigs. He then placed them in a round hover-and-fly aircraft and sent them to America, hoping to set off a kind of mass panic 
that came after the War of the Worlds radio scare. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. And what was the basis for his story? Had he seen the craft? Had he seen these deformed children? He and four other engineers were the recipients of what he calls the equipment, the equipment and the people. And as he told me, two of them were still alive. And he held them. And so the way he described them to me, many times he's described them to me, is always with this horrible sense of looking down at them. Not only was her source ordered to reverse engineer the flying disc, she writes, but also the people inside. And she alleges Area 51 engineers began their own human experiments, a program that ran for decades. I believe that is the truth of why Area 51 is still classified. So your source believes that there was American medical testing done on children. According to my source, they were handicapped children and prisoners. The dozen experts we contacted all scoffed at her Roswell theory. Well, it's just not even conceivable. It's not even conceivable. Including Cold War historian Amy Knight. I think it's highly unlikely that Mengele would have been drawn into any kind of an agreement with Stalin or the Soviet government. After writing more than 30 books on aviation history, Jay Miller says there is no way the Russians or anyone else could have flown such a mission. It was physically impossible to fly the four or five or six thousand miles that she's claiming they flew in order to accomplish this amazing feat. Surely you must have obsessed over how to double source this. How do you confirm this? Well, I'm not sure that it's my job to prove it. I do know it was my job to report it, and that's what I, what I did. Can I talk to your source? He, he, I have asked. She insists that her source is the last man living with a secret no one could understand. And he confided in her just bits of information over a hundred plus hours of conversation. But shortly after that interview, we managed to track down Annie's top secret source living here in Nevada. And within minutes of entering his home, Heard him describe that Russian flying saucer filled with mutilated children. He says he's afraid he'll be arrested if he goes public. He's also afraid Al-Qaeda might kidnap him for his engineering knowledge. He's a genuinely likable guy with impeccable credentials. But given a few holes in his story and the fact he's almost 90 years old, it's impossible to know whether this whole thing is something he witnessed, heard about, or imagined. I'll challenge Annie Jacobson about this new revelation. How do you know that this sweet old guy wasn't just telling you things he thought you wanted to hear? When Nightline continues. Back to the tale of Area 51, a place that holds, according to author Annie Jacobson, a Soviet flying saucer, the bodies of mutant children, and evidence that Americans performed gruesome experiments on disabled kids. She insists those allegations came from a reputable former Area 51 engineer, but when Jacobson brought him to us, he contradicted several of her claims. To us, this man in his late 80s seemed obviously confused and conflicted, so he promised to protect his identity, but we were also keen to see how Jacobson would act while selling her book. This is a, a really great book. Area At every stop on her promotional tour, Annie Jacobson has fiercely base. stood by her book as it is written. Base. Who was on the spacecraft? Well, there were some child-sized aviators, and that's what's most disturbing about my book. It was not Martians, it was actually the Russians. It had been Stalin's idea, and it was originally of a Third Reich design. Unbelievable. You have to read the book. If you're sitting there scratching your head at home and you're wondering, uh, Annie has done an incredible piece of journalism here. And after repeated requests and a tense negotiation, she agreed to sit down with me a second time to discuss the discrepancies. He told us he never touched the people that were in that craft. When he discusses this with me and he describes the, the child size aviators and he talks about them and he would go like this. My interpretation is that he held them. But when I challenged the shifting story, she accused me of nitpicking. He corroborated everything in my book with two discrepancies. I see absolutely no problem with that. He told us that he came to you, that he made these revelations. 
out of a sense of patriotic guilt. That is correct. When I asked him, why are you here? Why are you talking about this after all this time? He said, quote, to help Annie's book. Bill, you're absolutely taking one sentence out of context. All the information that I have from this source is absolutely credible. I examined How? How? You ha you're not able to vet any of the things he's telling you. I've looked at his work history. I've looked that at his war history. That has nothing to do with the story. It's it possible. There are Korean War veterans who have false memories about massacres that never happened. Bill, you're, you're taking this way out into left field. I, think, I am? <laughs> I think that we ha Hang on. I think that we have to agree to disagree because I know what I think and I stand by the veracity of my source. I absolutely do. I stand by everything that he told me. I have notes. I have audio tapes. I have records. I have documents. I matter. have I've a breadth him. of information. Annie, you I've are entitled him. to think what you like. My producer but met him. I'm not asking it's you to believe it, Bill, because you don't have to. I absolutely stand by my source's veracity. And well, the how other, can you believe The this? other important thing is that I also have worked with many of his colleagues. There's absolutely no chance that that last chapter is true in any fashion. Not only was T.D. Barnes one of Jacobson's main sources, he's also president of a group of Area 51 alumni. He told us he still supports the first part of her book, but says many of his members who worked with her are now outraged. They think they were snookered. And this is what's so disturbing to us because some of the people that's in the book are 88 years old. This is their last chance probably to get their story told. The opinion of the people that contact me think she just did it to... Uh, make the book about the author and, and not about, the, about us and it to, to make it sale. TD and his peers hope people will seek out the new Area 51 documentary on the National Geographic Channel and visit the Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. I think the whole world should see this because it's a piece of history that has been kept secret for so long. And they hope people focus on the real legacy of Area 51, the men who risked their lives in thankless silence. You can see more about Area 51 declassified this Saturday on the Nat Geo channel.